Great. Well, there's some of you that need no introduction. You have uh, been keynote speakers over the last uh, two days. Uh, but uh, I think starting from uh, your right, my left, uh, we would like to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, George Carlson from uh, this institution, from the SLU. Um, he uh, has um, he works in the Department of Biosystems and Technology, and uh, I'm sure that we will find out more about uh, what uh, George can share with us during the course of this discussion. Uh, we then have... Uh, now, I must just get myself organized here so uh, I can introduce everybody. We have Jasper uh, Bjarnason from the Nordic Africa Institute, uh, who has led some of the sessions and uh, I don't think needs any further introduction. Uh, Anne Larson, whom you all heard earlier. Uh, Moses, who has just uh, uh, spoken with us. Um, uh, and then we have uh, Carton, who's not going to speak about fisheries. He's going to, no, he's going to speak about uh, <laughs> uh, aquaculture predominantly. He's also attached to the uh, SLU. Um, and then we have a uh, keynote speaker from yesterday, Fred uh, Zingu from uh, the uh, University of Ghana in uh, Accra. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Anna Tengbray from uh, the uh, from Lund University, and Anna is going to have to leave us fairly shortly after the end of this uh, discussion. We were looking at the issue of uh, um, the annual versus perennial crops, and uh, in the first keynote speech yesterday. Uh, Professor Leonard Olson uh, talked about the possibility that we might have been on the wrong track for the previous millennia. Uh, the uh, domestication of uh, cereals, which occurred in Mesopotamia uh, millennia ago, has led us into a, an agricultural system which is built on the cultivation of annual crops, and he introduced the interesting concept that uh, we may need to look at a lot of the systems that have been developed to feed the world and that have reached some kind of an apex with technology and science and fertilizers and agrochemicals and machinery and a massive industrial agricultural complex over the last few decades, and now we are needing to reconsider a lot of things. So. We need to go back and look at history and see where possibly we can learn from history and where we may have gone wrong. So I would like to perhaps begin with George. And uh, if you look back at history, George, uh, what can we learn from history and what would you like to see as major opportunities that we can find from our reflection and the changes that we can engage ourselves in making. Do you have a microphone? Uh, I beg your pardon, yes, we do have a microphone. Uh, I thought I would take the advantage and uh, be the only one with a microphone. Uh, all right, there you go. Is it on? Yes, yes. good. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a large question to start with. Um, I, th I think I'll take it from, from the perspective of the session that I believe I, I'm representing here, the one on uh, di diversified agroecological cropping systems. Um, so there I see a clear link with what is, what is known we, when we look back in history is on the actual use of diversified cropping systems, using, for example, mixtures of crops, uh, which is still in place in many smallholder family farms, and works relatively well for, for feeding families with very low environmental impact. Uh, some of the research that has been presented here in the conference shows that if we learn from those systems and try to implement larger uh, crop diversity also in the now modern intensified uh, production systems in the, um, in the part of the world that I represent, we can mitigate our environmental impact uh, and thereby 
I see a clear link that if we are able to emit less greenhouse gases from our intensified production systems, we will free up land and, and, and help low-income countries to have a, a better space for their development of food security. So I think that yeah, that was a, a long way to say that crop diversification and, and, and use of uh, uh, experience and, and historical knowledge on how to combine uh, traits and, and uh, uh, functions of different crops is a key, key aspect. Uh, yes, uh, can I pass this along? Anna, you have... Uh Yes, uh, I would uh, like to add that I think we also need to put this in, in the context of uh, climate change and rapid uh, population growth. I don't think that the, these systems, uh, tra traditional agriculture systems or monocultures were perhaps so unsustainable when they first appeared because we were then not in the Atrop Anthropocene that we are today. So people were few and far apart and we still could there was still diversity in the landscape. But now, with these uh, pressures, we have to do something to, to recreate this diversity, uh, to stabilize yields, uh, to um, promote multiple functions of landscapes uh, that generate not only uh, food, but other ecosystem services important for human well-being, such as uh, water, regulation of climate, etc. Fred, Anna, you have something to add? I do. I think one of the things that struck me most about that presentation yesterday morning was the, the whole piece he didn't talk much about, which was this institutionalized system of profit making that isn't really about feeding the planet, but is about making money off of agriculture, which is very different. And to me, that sort of fits into um, you know, where did we go wrong? Uh, maybe something around neoliberal economics kind of taking over the planet is where, where we've gone wrong. And I think I'm really attracted to the, uh, the donut economics model, I don't know how many people are familiar with, that Kate Rayworth has uh, written about. And I find it particularly appealing. Uh, the donut is, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, has sort of the outer edge, which is these, you know, e the limits of the planet, the ecological limits, biophysical limits, climate change, these kinds of issues. And the inner circle is human well-being. Um, and the, the instead of GDP growth as being our goal, it sets the goal in that the ring, which is the, the donut part, which is really a healthy population on a healthy planet. And I think that uh, it, I don't know even how to begin that change, but it's a radical change. And I think that uh, we need to make it. It's, we're at that moment. We're at a turning point. Moses. Um, well, I, 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 um, I want to challenge uh, this uh, uh, conceptual idea uh, that was presented uh, uh, on the first day. Um, I think it it's obviously has a lot of merits, but uh, you know, we often say, uh, there's a common saying probably even here, that don't throw their baby with the bathwater. And uh, certainly I suspect that for some crops it might be very useful to have uh, move them and go back to the, the perennials and benefit from all the benefits of them. But I think we may also need to take more time to really uh, look closely at where this might work and where this may not uh, uh, work necessarily. I think similarly, uh, I think there were two other presentations um, which had very similar messages. Uh, one, I think, was uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Fred here. And the second one was uh, from, uh, I don't know it's called, Eric from CIRAD. And I think one message that came out in his presentation was the need to, um, to ensure that we try to mimic the natural ecosystems, I think was the way he, he, he put it. And uh, if you go to many farming systems, uh, at least in, in, in rural Africa, you'll find that Farmers always uh, find ways of, of uh, planting crops, not so much as monocrops, but to have uh, different types of crops, different uh, types of uh, varieties, and different types of, in a way that probably more mimics the natural ecosystem. I'm not, that may not be the most efficient uh, system, but I think that's what we have to try to find, where it's advantageous to use perennials and where it may not be. I think we shouldn't assume that necessarily everything should go uh, the, other, the other side of the pendulum. 
Great. Um, yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think that uh, you know it, it's very easy to be uh, distracted by uh, um, activists and by uh, this concept that you throw the baby out with the bathwater, that you condemn all monocultures, uh, and uh, you, you know, what we're looking at here is a balance. What can we learn from the past? What can we implement from uh, uh, the systems that produce food effectively? Uh, on the basis that they are not, uh, that they are sustainable and not destructive to uh, our human systems and to our environment. Um, so, I mean, in on, in 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 that spirit, uh, I, we had a discussion earlier uh, during the break, Cartin uh, uh, and, and myself, about uh, aquaculture and about the uh, a system that has existed in China where uh, you have uh, the coexistence of different production systems uh, that you have learned a lot from? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, when it comes to aquaculture, when um, there was, a, it all started in China around like 3000 BC, so, so it's a quite long ago. And what they have been doing there is to culture fish along with, uh, with rice, come fish culture or something like that. Then we, are, of course, with uh, with uh, with uh, um, advancement of the technology in terms of research and development, then we go for more intensive monoculture. But then we have started having all those problems, disease, and then you know the antibiotics and all those things. But what we have learned uh, from this is that now we are going back to the uh, to the to the past again. We are, we are trying to integrate everything. And of course, if we do a multiple way of culturing, be it with uh, with rice, come fish, or or, or with a different variety of fish, I think it reduces the risk of of of, uh, of um, economic loss because we can have different crops, and also you can maintain a harmony with the with the, the one of the speakers men mentioned about this mimicking the ecosystem, and that's how we try to do it. And now, of course, thanks to the, uh, uh, all the all the or the technology that we have developed. And now we are planning to do this RAS system so we can do land-based aquaculture system. This was not possible, I think, a few decades ago. Now we can do these things together with, you know, you can grow along with fish, you can with the water coming out from the fish uh, farms, you can culture potato or tomato, and we can do everything. In a, it, it's more term called aquaponics, of course, we can do everything. So this is uh, quite an interesting, and I, I personally see this is a future that we have to really take it forward. Um, and what I would like to add here also in the whole biology, we are also adding internet of things there. Just to give you an idea, I was reading an article there. We have the, the, an, a group somewhere in, and I think it was in the United States, they have developed a technology that they can completely regulate the feeding of the fish. So as soon as they see the fish have eaten enough, the, the system gives an indication. It's completely based on sensor system, then they stop feeding. So re this reduces the, the waste, uh, nitrogen loss or phosphorus loss. So if we can bring everything to together, be it the agriculture, be it the aquaculture, be it technology, I think we have a future with, uh, uh, I mean, we can have a sustainable way of farming, be it aquaculture, be it uh, agriculture, or be it veterinary, any other veterinary animals, in fact. Yeah. Fred, uh, w we talk, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the 1970s when technology yeah. was going to save us, it was going to feed the planet, we were going to increase production uh, at an exponential rate, uh, and uh, you know, it was all about yields. Uh, you've been doing your survey uh, in, uh, in, in, in Ghana, you've been looking at markets, you've been looking at production, you've been looking at yields. Uh, um, could you share some of your insights with us? Yeah, well, um, of course yields are, are, are important, but um, my main point was that uh, farmers are not interested in yields for the sake of it. They're interested in yields uh, because uh, yields can provide them, increased yields can provide them with uh, a livelihood or an outcome which is better than what they have. So, uh, and to have that, um, you need to think more carefully about the whole livelihood system. Uh, of rural households. So uh, that includes, of course, um, 
their inputs, but also it includes markets. Um, it includes, um, because they face multiple constraints, uh, like I've been saying, so just looking at uh, one constraint of why they are not increasing their yields and giving them uh, inputs or subsidies on fertilizers or seeds alone does not work because even if their yields increase and uh, they don't get uh, good markets, then the incentive to invest um, is not there anymore. I'll give you an example. I mean, the, I think in the mid 2000s, there were all kinds of presidential special initiatives on um, certain crops in Ghana, one of which was cassava. So they brought in this um, high yielding variety of cassava that is meant mainly for starch production and uh, a lot of campaigns about it. Um, farmers grew a lot of cassava, uh, had I mean, increased yields, and uh, there was no factory in place. I mean, there was supposed to be a factory uh, so the farmers can sell their cassava for starch production. But it wasn't there, so farmers grew cassava, there was no market for it, and then you know, there was a problem. So in those kind of areas, if you introduce to them again technologies that are supposed to increase yields, um, then there is a hold back on, on investment. So we need to look at, you know, the livelihoods of farmers and the rural people as a whole in designing, you know, policies um, that could um, increase uh, production. So it's not just increasing production, but looking at the whole value chain. Um, that, well, that's what is important. Uh, Jesper, you uh, have an insight on this issue. Well, if I could just add, um, so I, I was inspired by Laura Hammond's uh, keynote yesterday on, on sort of my, the migration mobility perspective here, and I think that uh, one of her main points was, was to emphasize the diversity of livelihood strategies that people actually have, and that mobility is often a key part in how people both sort of uh, uh, spread out uh, you know, their, their risk taking on, on different options, but also react to unexpected uh, challenges and crises. Uh, and in that perspective, agricultural production at different levels would be one among several options that people uh, keep uh, present in their lives in, in order to be able to adapt to unexpected circumstances. Uh, so, and I, th I think that thinking of livelihood strategies that include agricultural production but are not limited to agricultural production might also be, for example, a way to appeal to a young generation that, uh, as we heard, for example, in the uh, uh, report earlier today, right, that, you know, w we need to attract young people into agricultural production. And I think one aspect there might be to embrace this diversity in people's interests and options rather than uh, uh, think in terms of sort of a, a, a monolith of agricultural production which is based in rural areas strictly and unconnected to other spheres and, and sectors. So I think it's sort of a, yeah, a mobility perspective that, that plays into this idea of, of livelihood diversification. And I'm not sure uh, uh, to what extent your uh, research into tenure, security of tenure, access to land uh, has also addressed uh, agricultural production, but uh, um, can you address the importance of uh, the, uh, the security of land tenure? Well, I haven't worked that much on agricultural production myself, but certainly just looking at the, I mean, in the tenure uh, workshop earlier today, there were a couple people presenting specifically on agriculture and um, you know, there's no question that the security of uh, the land has a plays a big role in terms of the investments people are making and the, the um, what they're willing to put into that land in terms of labor um, for agricultural production. But it's not really my strength. I would definitely work more on the forest and the the larger landscape mm -hmm. scale. Fred, you would like to add to that. Yeah, I think um, there is evidence um, that uh, uh, security of tenure, um, in this case land, uh, uh, stimulates investment. But sometimes I think, they, especially in the African context, um, uh, that evidence is sometimes overstretched. I'll give you another example in Ghana where uh, talking about uh, 
land titling and uh, making the assumption that okay, if you you give people you know format titles to land, um, it will inst uh, it will stimulate investments. Um, we have not seen that evidence because the the thing is um, the uh, traditional land tenor systems um, that we have in, in, in parts of Ghana, even though people don't have titles to land per se, um, the issue really is uh, about other incentives um, to invest um, rather than just having land uh, titles. And, but the other thing also about uh, tenor systems that we, we, we need to address is about um, how it creates um, gender differences in terms of uh, people's incentives uh, to invest in, in land. So in the northern parts of Ghana and also in some parts of the south where you have uh, women's um, access to land restricted in many ways, um, that creates um, a hold back in, in terms of investments, uh, particularly on, on certain plots because women cannot, um, you know, even if they invested in it, um, especially the certain crops that are considered uh, to be, um, well, male crops, they cannot then reap the investments, uh, the returns to those, those investments. So that gender aspect um, to, to land and land tenure security is also important in, in that respect, uh, especially in the Ghanaian case that I, I know of. So some of the, I, I have, was thinking a little bit about some of the parallels between the, in terms of land tenure security and what are the, what are the drivers of security, what are the things actually bring about security, and this came across on the, both the collective and the individual lands that um, the title may increase security, it may not always, but may not always be necessary, but certainly the sort of your ancestral claim to that land and your, your use of that land, so the ongoing use and, and claim, I think is something we've seen throughout um, both the collective and private land, that being able to be there, be present, and use it, is often uh, the biggest sign, the most important piece of security, aside from potentially the title. Um, that, so ag again, making sure we don't equate title with security there, there are other issues that play a really important role in all resources. Um, there's no doubt that we are probably one of the most influential revolutions that we're uh, uh, experiencing at the moment is information technology and uh, the connectedness of our world, uh, which consequently affects aspirations, uh, people's choice of career, people's choice of uh, occupation. So. You know, as has been said so many times, you cannot assume that uh, rural youth will choose a, uh, a career in agriculture or food production. Um, Moses, you have been, uh, in, you're, you're involved in education, you're involved in excellent and the excellence and the creation of a, of a skills base. Uh, are we looking at a future where we have uh, smaller, more efficient um, uh, uh, food production units, and do we have support policies and support uh, infrastructure in place for, for this shift? I'm not sure that I uh, understand the question very clearly, um, but I think what, what I would say, if I understand um, what you're asking, is that um, at present, I think one of the, uh, the, the speakers, I don't, it must have been yesterday, uh, talked about um, that most of our food actually comes from uh, small uh, family farms uh, across, across the world. And uh, in terms of uh, what we expect going into the future, that's, that's the question that we have to ask about what, what's going to be most efficient. Uh, and in terms of how those, um, those farms can make use of um, uh, the new uh, technologies, as you mentioned, like ICT, uh, to be able to uh, to support them to be more efficient, whether that whether that means uh, in terms of uh, access to to, to markets um, through um, aggregation um, or, or through being able to um, to overcome the challenges that are often um, linked to to standards. 
um, because again, with, with exports that, that go, food that moves across uh, countries and often across continents, one of the major challenges still remains the issue of, of, of standards and how to ensure that actually we can conform uh, to, those, uh, uh, to those standards. Uh, with one of the issues also being things like aflatoxins and, and, uh, and issues like that. So I think um, certainly both, um, and also maybe the other issue coming back to the, issue, the question of, of, of land tenure is also being able to, to aggregate uh, land which may be owned by, but may have different ownerships, but to be able to bring them together and, and, uh, and to be more efficient in terms of how production is done. Uh, there was an interesting um, uh, app that was developed, I think it's also Kenya, where they had um, a way you could use a tractor uh, and you could use an app to, to bring the tractor to your field and plow for you the land. And so you didn't have to own a tractor, it didn't have to be near you, but through the app you could somehow uh, make use of this, um, uh, this equipment much more efficiently. So I think um, a lot of it will remain on, on, uh, on, on how we prepare our farmers for, for the future and how we allow them to access the technologies that might be available to support the way they decide to organize themselves. Another issue that has been discussed uh, during this conference has been uh, you know, customs and uh, the, uh, the dietary habits of uh, different groups. Uh, so it may well be most efficient and most nutritious to produce a particular kind of food, but how does one address the acceptance of, uh, of, of these different healthy nutritional products within traditional communities? I mean, I, for instance, have witnessed many times, uh, you know, I've been in refugee camps in West Africa where uh, they are provided with, with bulgur, and uh, people would rather suffer malnutrition because they're not getting rice. Uh, so uh, how does one address this challenge of custom? Maybe, Fred, you could uh, kick us off. And I mean, the same thing would go for aquaculture. You know, there you have yeah. a fantastic source of, of protein and minerals and, you know, all-round nutrition, but for many, many people, it's, you know, close to being taboo. But I, I think the, the whole definition of uh, food security itself also includes the issue of cultural acceptability. Um, so, of course, you, 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 if you give somebody, because uh, the person needs protein and you give the person dog meat, you say, well, it's, uh, it's meat, um, so you've got to eat it. Uh, it's not culturally acceptable to me, um, so I'm not going to, to eat it. In the same way, you know, that will sound strange, but uh, uh, if you give somebody um, food that is not culturally acceptable, um, even if the food is available, uh, the person is not food secure. Um, so, you know, we, if um, culture is, uh, is a barrier um, to food security, um, then we need to try and deal with it, but also not forget about the cultural acceptability of, of the food. Um, so we need to develop um, whatever new varieties of food that we have within the context of uh, people's, uh, how people accept it, their cultural acceptability. It's we can't uh, take it away and say, well, we develop a new variety of potato, a new variety of maize, so you have to eat it. So that's what I would say. Yeah, in, in development projects I've been involved in in my past career with UN, um, we often targeted uh, women and uh, focused on, uh, had activities focused on developing new recipes for them, how to use these new crops or other uh, food that was produced. Um, and it could also be combined with, you know, support to new cooking stoves and things like that. It may not solve all, all problems, but it's one, um, one possible uh, action. Um. The other side of this, of course, is the opposite, which is the amount of very poor, the foods of very poor nutritional value, like soda, Coca-Cola, chips, and things like that, that are also being kind of pushed on many communities um, and seen as somehow culturally more advanced 
than eating insects or the worms or things that people have been eating uh, in you know, native communities, for example, historically. So you have uh, a whole other cultural imposition that's very, very unhealthy happening at the same time. Yes, but you've worked with uh, displaced communities and with the concept of displacement, so I'm sure that you have a lot of insights. Right, well, I, I think I'll start off sort of as, as an anthropologist, uh, uh, you know, being drilled with different critiques of the idea of culture and custom throughout my, my studies. And, and just to say that um, I think um, it's important to acknowledge that um, I would speculate that, that the, um, rather than, than culture being um, an obstacle in and of itself, um, the introduction of new uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, or new dietary uh, regimes and so on might be more about the top downness of it than the cultural value in and of itself, right? And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that food security is first and foremost the concern of people who are not able to, to meet dietary standards, to be able to eat in a sensible way, in a, in a sufficient way, right? And that, that interventions, whether it's from national governments or from humanitarian actors, is minimal, generally speaking, in, in poor communities to their, their, uh, their food needs, right? So I, I wouldn't f highlight culture as the main obstacle to what people consume, but rather think about the way uh, uh, changes are introduced into local communities. Because I think that generally, and this comes now to, to sort of the, the experience of displaced populations as well, there's a tendency to be fairly wary or suspicious of uh, anything that is imposed from the outside, because it's, it rarely, uh, it's not just a cultural thing, it's rarely, it's usually short-sighted, it's usually uh, not particularly culturally sensitive, and it you know it, it's fairly minimal in in the overall experiences of people who are living through difficult circumstances. So I think the cultural aspect is of, of course important, but I think that thinking in terms of introducing changes in dietary uh, regimes, I think we need to think more about ownership and and where that demand is coming from, rather than the cultural side of it as a, as a an obstacle. Can I continue a bit? Uh, I think that this this uh, question about why are solutions not adopted in, in, in the range that, that those who have developed the solutions expect is, is quite common. It's quite general feature that, that in my view, calls for uh, simply saying, I mean, more inter- and transdisciplinary collaborations, more, more integration of all different perspectives using the knowledge from, from different disciplines on, on what are the, the intended end users actually asking for, what are their expectations, and then maybe turning to an agronomist or an engineer to see how can this be met, and, and having a, a, a genuine interest, interest in, in understanding different perspectives and, and, and working together. And that, just to say that that, in my view, is, is very central in how we uh, at SLU work with agroecology. So this is uh, integrating different disciplines and perspectives in, in looking for, for solutions for more sustainable development. Um, thank you. Okay. Just while I pass the mic, sorry, just to add that, that um, there is a tendency, uh, so what I was trying to, to say is that there is a tendency also to see culture as only being the property of the most, the poorest, uh, and the most sort of globally marginalized. There's this idea that they have culture out there and we do not. And of course, any dietary regime, whether it's in, in uh, Stockholm or in Kampala or in a village somewhere, is influenced by cultural ideas of what is appropriate and what is delicious, etc. So just to emphasize that, you know, culture is everywhere, not just where we want to impose changes from uh, the outside. a good comment. I, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to add to this uh, discussion. First, I think it was in um, Zambia. I think it was a few, uh, I don't know how many years, aw years ago it was that um, I think it was yellow maize that was uh, delivered from, uh, from the US. And uh, yellow maize is not uh, um, usually is, is uh, not eaten by, by a number of uh, groups. Uh, who think it's more for cattle and not for, 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 for people. And this caused lots of uh, um, negative 
uh, feedback uh, in terms of uh, how the groups that, that receive this, uh, this maze. But I think also in terms of when we talk about culture, we also need to consider other cultural things that probably we think ne could need to be changed. And I think then you relate that back to food and the issues we're discussing here. If you take, um, uh, again, I um, have a close uh, relative who uh, in, his, uh, in his home, he used to um, help his wife with, uh, with, with the washing and, uh, and sometimes, of course, the washing had to be done just outside. And as villagers would pass by, uh, some of them were quite abusive about how this man can be washing clothes. Uh, this is not a job for, for a man to, to, to do. And I think uh, the point I want to make is that uh, this calls actually for leadership. That I think it's actually the, the, uh, the leaders within those communities and at the national level to, to both educate and to try to create the changes that, that we need to create, whether that be uh, food that, that comes that not, may not fit. So they should be able to understand the, the level at which the population needs to, to move to, to help them to accept or, or not accept what has been uh, provided in, in a period of, of, uh, of challenges. And many countries now, as we saw in the presentation from the, um, the Horn of Africa, and again, of course, we know we have many African countries who are um, just post-conflict or within conflict still and are having challenges with, uh, with food. So I think it's really the lo role of, of the leadership to support in terms of education, in terms of awareness, and ensure that people can benefit from what, what's available. So I, I, I guess a very simple conclusion to this is that uh, um, what is required is a very much more sensitive, bottom-up consultative process, as well as the encouragement of strong leadership for the adoption of uh, cultural practices that are positive and that lead to better outcomes. Is anybody else able to sum this up better than I can? I think awareness is also very important. I mean, uh, I came to Europe uh, 15 years ago. I have never eaten uh, octopus, for instance. I have never seen an octopus. When I was in India, I have never seen an octopus. I came here, I found an, on my plate an octopus. And I just tested it and I liked it. So then now when I go and I ask for as, as a starter, I always ask an octopus. It's a, so it takes time. But when I talk, tell to my parents that I have eaten octopus, they start, oh, what do you have done there? <laughs> so it takes time. It also takes time. It, it will really take time. And I totally agree that there should be an awareness there. And, 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 and when my brother came to, to, to Sweden, I offered him an octopus. And now he's back to India and he said, that was a delicious. So it takes time. <laughs> it will take time, awareness and awareness. Maybe the next time my brother will give to my children, uh, to his children, and it will, it will be take time. We cannot change the, the culture just on overnight. It is very difficult. So it will, uh, it will need a little bit of, you know, and we have to start from our own, own, own house, I think. Mm -hmm. It's very important that, um, just to add. So in, in, to add what I'm telling is that like awareness is very important. Yeah. All right, well, we are drawing to the end of the time that we have available. So uh, I think I have two more issues that I would like to address. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in my profession as a filmmaker and as a journalist, uh, I meet an incredible diversity of uh, our complex uh, species. And I mean, of course, this is fantastic. It's stimulating, it gives me great joy. Uh, I meet people under all kinds of circumstances, and often the more challenging they are, the more, uh, uh, the more people r rise to meet these challenges. Uh, but, you know, one conclusion that uh, is uh, uh, indisputable is that we all share fairly similar and often quite modest uh, aspirations. So, I mean, at this particular juncture in our history, it seems uh, uh, extraordinary that uh, such a large proportion of our society are, are not expected to fulfill even the most basic aspirations, such as the capacity to produce or acquire adequate, adequate uh, nutrition. And that's why we are all gathered here. So I think if we can just go around from left to right and uh, uh, 
the conclusions, you, you have attended sessions, you have listened to the keynote speakers, we've had a tremendous amount of input uh, in these last two days. George, perhaps you could begin. Um, so the, the, the challenges are enormous, and, and it's, I think that what you're after maybe is, is uh, that it's a failure by the global community that we still have so many uh, that are food insecure, and that's why we're unfortunately here around that topic. So, so it's, uh, uh, I, I come back to what I, I said before, that, that there are large challenges, there are complex uh, mechanisms behind the problems, the, the, the tendency of looking at one problem at a time has not been able to solve the problem, so, so again, uh, I mean, integrating different expertises to understand the complexity and identify uh, solutions that are, uh, are feasible. Um, yeah, maybe that's that's uh, on a conceptual level. It it's, it sounds good, but then to mm -hmm. to implement uh, that that uh, transdisciplinary approach is uh, of course challenging. But maybe we have. Uh, some of course, we have all the tools to be able to communicate on a far more effective level. But as you say, you know, a lot of disciplines are still very have tunnel vision. Well, perhaps just to, uh, to take a jab at another aspect of that, I think not being an expert on any research relating to food production at all, uh, I would just say that, first of all, what I think came out strongly in the panel on migration governance and food security was that, as you say, people are indeed extremely resourceful and resilient in the face of massive challenges. And I've seen it in my own research as well that many times uh, people manage despite of, not because of governance regimes at different levels, often policies are actually impeding or preventing people from realizing their aspirations and their, their own cap capacities. Uh, and I think that's particularly true at the present moment in relation to mobility and migration, both at national and, and international uh, scales. And I think that one, to me, the, the sort of the, the big uh, piece missing in talking about sustainable food production and food consumption is to talk about the global north. Uh, food production and consumption in our countries are by no means sustainable uh, at a global level, right? And I'm not saying that as an expert, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, the idea that, that sustainability is something that uh, the global north is imposing on the global south or, or encouraging in the global south needs to be matched by a the, the activist and critical voices that are coming out in terms of how we consume uh, food, among other things, in our countries. And I think those two things have to go together because, for example, when you see in the case of migration governance, what characterizes most uh, of, the mo of the sort of most uh, uh, dominant policies is a turf war between the global north and the global south. Uh, the global north protecting its privilege against uh, the global south. And I think that has to be a part of the discussion rather than isolating uh, uh, the poorest uh, uh, and, and placing the problem as far away f from us as possible. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, totally agree with the two people who have spoken before me. And I guess, you know, to reiterate, basically the, the change starts with us. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I feel very old. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the oldest person on this panel, but I may be close to it. Um, and I f sometimes I, th I look back at things I wrote 20 years ago or read now and re read the same things 30 years ago. I mean, some of the things we're saying are the same things we've been saying over and over again. And uh, maybe the one strategy that really hasn't been tried is precisely that one of working with local people, working with the solutions that they've, they're they already developing, the resilience they already have, building on that. And uh, as scientists um, coming into these places with humility and, uh, and with a a learning perspective and not assuming that we have the technological solution, we have the, the food that they ought to be eating, but that we need to fix ourselves and work with, uh, with local people to promote the processes that they're already working on. So, so would you say that uh, we have a failure of leadership in the global north? I mean, on, on many levels, we have... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think Donald Trump is a great <laughs> northern leader. 
<laughs> we definitely have a failure of leadership. Oh. But I think we also, um, we shouldn't be leading by ourselves. We, we need to be partnering with people on the ground and not think we need, we need to lead in our own house and clean up our own house and work with uh, leaders in the global south to, as a support network, but not the ones with the answers. Well, I, I think one of the sad things about um, where we are now is um, that we will actually decrease uh, the mobility across uh, across the globe. And I think that's one of the, the really um, useful tools uh, to help us to understand each other and how we live and how what our aspirations are and, and, and who we are. Uh, I think it's, uh, mobility is a really strong tool, uh, both uh, speaking from the perspective of, of Africa within Africa. I think also you, you had these challenges of uh, South Africa and, and, uh, and others. I think um, it's all these uh, different things that have been happening of recent, whether it's uh, Brexit or the US. I think they, they, they work towards reducing mobility, which I think will, will, will be a challenge. I think mobility is a really important tool uh, that we can use to um, help us to really understand each other a lot, a lot better, and and, uh, and who we are. I think the second is, um, again, about uh, education and awareness. Uh, I think really to um, to help all of us to uh, to understand better uh, who we are, and and uh, and um, and this shared world that that we we, we live in. I think uh, having that um, that education for everyone, I think, will will add a lot of uh, of value. Yeah, I, I, that's a very, very strong point. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, the experience is that uh, people from the global north uh, would oppose and resent any restrictions on their mobility while at the same time imposing uh, very, very strict uh, restrictions on the movement of people from the developing world. So that's a, a, an extremely valid point. I mean, I have had an African passport and uh, experienced the same kind of... Uh, challenges that, uh, you know, fortunately I have education and access and uh, am one of the more privileged people from the global south, but uh, it is an enormous frustration that it is such an unequal uh, um, implementation of uh, uh, policy. Well, uh, that's true. Um, for, to my opinion, I think we should look at the world more as a global village. And rather than as a, you know, like separating everything. So we should really look at the, the whole world as a global village. Now, I totally agree with what you have been mentioning, like mobility and, uh, and the, the exchange programs, they're critical. Just to give an example, look at Vietnam today. I think 20, 20 years ago, Vietnam, in terms of aquaculture, I can say a few words about Vietnam. We, they were just culturing fish. Now they're exporting fish, shrimps, fish, Pangasias everywhere. If you go to the supermarkets here, if you look at the uh, shrimps, it's all Vietnam or mostly Vietnam, uh, Thailand and all. And how that happened is that, uh, if I may use the word not, they play a big role in the capacity development. Of course, there the mobility and exchange programs were very uh, critical. Now, we have a number of alumni working either from SLU or my previous university, Ghent University, have a number of alumni working there in term, in, 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 in the, in the, at the university or in the companies, and they're working, they're doing fantastic job, culturing fish in a most scientific way, producing in the most, uh, you know, and, and they're also meeting all the requirements that they, they need to export the fish uh, or shrimps to Europe, in fact. So, so important for us is capacity development and mobility, and I think this is, the two are very critical. I totally agree with you. In fact, thanks. Great, so thank you. I'm going to, uh, Fred. If, if I can just give Anne the, uh, Anna the chance to, uh, because she's got a train to catch. Yes, so. yes I'm really well <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> and thank then you. you will have the last word. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that uh, this, uh, despite the fact that the challenges are huge, this conference has also made me hopeful. I think we have a lot of knowledge about good practices and te technologies, even if we don't have all the solutions. Uh, we even have knowledge about the, the barriers to scaling up these uh, good practices related to policies, institutions, uh, awareness, access to knowledge. Um, so we just have to continue working and um, 
making uh, this you know, transition happen that is really needed to make our food systems more sustainable. Great. Thank you very much. And if you would like to leave us, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you very much. Fred, you get the last word. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that uh, the challenges that we face, uh, uh, there are multiple challenges um, which will require multiple solutions. Um, but we have to remain hopeful. Um, and if there are leadership failures, I don't think it's uh, leadership failures just from the global north. It's also leadership failures uh, in the global south as well. I mean, um, there are I mean, issues of uh, lack of uh, investments in the right places, infrastructure, things that would make um, farmers more able to uh, innovate. Um, uh, not necessarily things that imposes um, solutions on farmers. This is the way you have to do it. I mean, they are smart. They know what to do. Um, if the right environment is created, um, they are able to innovate and, and create their own solutions. So this whole notion of we have the solution and uh, we know what you have to be doing um, is not really the right direction to go. Let's let um, government and leadership focus on removing constraints to, to investments, and I'm sure that farmers uh, themselves would, would invest and uh, make their own lives better than us trying to make their lives better. The way we can do it is to remove the constraints that uh, prevents them from, from investing. So that's what I would say. Well, thank you all very much for participating. Remove constraints, facilitate, and we have an enormous body of knowledge. It's a matter of coordination, integration, and let's all move forward with agriculture for development. Thank you so much. <laughs>